it's, it's a different situation than New York. It's, it's a very different situation. No, I get it. And what if we, we had, if we had, may I, may I sorry, be a my, member my of this committee, please? Do you mind? Yep, go ahead. <laughs> Where are you from, by the way? Uh, Los Angeles. Well, you see, perhaps you can do that in Los Angeles, but this is a district of Columbia, you see. And, and I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> This is city machinery at its just rawest. Some of the council members are looking to solve problems that are not known to exist. Fresh man, oh yeah. <laughs> but seriously. Uber is one of the more inventive transportation technologies of the last decade. It's a smartphone app you can use to call a car. It's proven hugely popular here in Washington, D.C., but it also was met with some staunch regulatory opposition. We're going to talk about what happened there, and what we find is going to reveal something very, very wrong with the way the capital city of the most powerful country on the planet runs itself. The cab industry here hadn't really changed at all, ever. The attitude for the longest time has been they're, they're like a utility, being regulated like any other basically public monopoly. Those are not the most innovative businesses in the world. That if you hail them on the street, there's a chance they won't pick you up, or there's a chance they'll tell you to get lost if you tell them that you want to go across town. Under cover of darkness, DC's taxis get worse. This driver stopped, but denied our Southeast DC destination request. He's got to go pick up two white passengers. Oh, uh, yeah, I got some white girls I can pick up. Okay. Basically, for those of you who don't know, we are an on-demand town car service. Our motto is everyone's private driver. Take out your smartphone, push a button, and a car appears within minutes. And when you get to your destination, you get out. It's cashless. It is 10 times better than dirty, filthy DC cabs. Convenient. I love getting text messages to tell me when a cab's outside. And now more and more people turning to the enormously popular and still expanding Uber. A lot more people now doing this instead of this when it comes to getting a cab. So Uber takes off, and the local regulators step in. I'd like you to meet Ron Linton. He's the head of the DC Taxi Cab Commission. I like Ron. He's charmingly eloquent and avuncular. I feel like he would tell excellent scary stories at the last campfire of Boy Scout camp. I've been in, in, in the public administration for 50 years. Won't go into my age, but it's substantially uh, greater than what 99.9% uh, .9 of everybody else in government. So there was a sting operation. Here at the Mayflower Hotel, there was a sting, nothing as dramatic as years ago. You recall with Elliot Spitzer and the Call Girls. Ron Linton hails an Uber. He gets in the car, has him take him around, drops him at the Mayflower Hotel where there's inspectors rating who write $1,000 tickets. Sort of the first shot in the Uber wars. And the council decides it needs to take a role. I initially had oversight of transportation for the district until I investigated the chair of the council for misuse of government resources, and then I no longer chaired the, the committee. Now I became chair of the Transportation Committee, so you know it fell to me and I said, we have to do something. They tried to set a floor on our pricing. That they have a, a minimum fare. Well, of course, on the eve of our adopting this, um, the head of Uber, you know, went how shall I say, berserk. 50,000 emails were sent by our riders. I've received over 5,000 emails. I got thousands. Startling email campaign. It was amazingly effective. $15 minimum it is, is eliminated from the bill. Nobody is flooding DC council members' inboxes with thousands of emails saying, save the cab industry. I can't believe this Uber thing is gonna come and ruin it. I know that you like to have um, you know, uh, to cast this as, you know, uh, some sort of fight. We're not in a fight with you. Do you understand that? I'm not in a fight with you. So... When you tell us how to do business and you tell us we can't charge lower fares, offer a high quality service okay, at the best well, possible you know, price, you are fighting with us. You, know, you, you still want to fight. So actually, uh, since I'm over my time and I don't want to fight with you, I'm going to turn to Council Member Bowser right. and, and we can okay. pursue this later. It ends with regulation that included wide berth for companies like Uber. Wow, 
That was impressive, but the fight is far from over. Despite that resounding legislative victory, the Taxi Cab Commission is still pursuing a long laundry list of controls on Uber. The first volley came earlier this summer when the commission attempted, ultimately unsuccessfully, to force Uber to use a standardized credit card processing machinery. There was no technical barrier for them receiving their information that they had to receive through the PSP. Therefore, they could integrate with it and not be outside the system. They didn't like that. The commission is also looking to institute annual reviews of Uber's mobile phone app. We need to look at what they're using as a handheld device before they use it, and once a year to take a look to see that they haven't substituted something else when we weren't looking. Most importantly, the commission is prohibiting the use of smaller vehicles and taxi services. Setting the minimum weight for vehicles used as a sedan at 3,200 pounds. This regulation really, really matters because it effectively prohibits UberX, which is Uber's lower cost new service that largely employs smaller hybrid vehicles. Or, as Commissioner Linton explains in the obligatorily opaque and stilted lingo, the embedded bureaucracy. Would not allow a sedan digital service company to uh, use somebody who owned a small Prius for sedan service. So what exactly is going on here? Why is it that the local DC regulators are hell-bent on still trying to fix something that has shown no signs that it needs to be fixed? You might think that's because some local entrenched taxicab industry representatives have co-opted key lawmakers and are trying to use the power of public policy to block out competition. You would be correct. I'm a friend of the taxi industry. I've always been. And me drivers, I'm outraged about this. Our homegrown industry is hit hard. But Uber wants to rule the world. That's where the $45 million investment is. God that owns Uber lives in San Francisco, California. The current operation is illegal. But I don't think that analysis does justice to the messy reality of what happened here. First of all, the push to protect the incumbent cab industry isn't solely a function of backroom deals. Part of the Taxi Commission's job is to protect the industry as it exists. Actually, in, in our statute, we're charged with assuring a uh, economically viable taxi cab industry. So when Ron Linton is pushing for measures that block out some of their competitors, he's not necessarily acting from a point of corruption. He might just be doing his job. We can't make decisions that allow one element in the industry to upend all the other elements and force vehicles out of existence. Second of all, Uber is not exactly pure in all of this. So here's the way things usually work in the DC Council. You have something you want to do that requires some change pay a lobbyist many hundreds of dollars an hour. Go set up some meetings down at the Wilson building and you hammer it out. And Uber actually did that. They hired a lobbyist. They've hired several lobbyists, in fact. The regulation ended up requiring that you did have to have a license. Well, this was great to Uber because Uber was the first to get that license. But there are other models out there. Sidecar effectively allows anyone to carpool that don't require licensing. They sort of stepped inside this regulatory velvet rope and then put it up right, right behind them. Third, this exclusive focus just on bad intentions doesn't appropriately account for the role of good intentions in office. Ron and many other members of the regulatory establishment here suffer from what I like to call the accidentally oppressive conceit of technocratic tinkering. To find the appropriate balance so that the person buying gets decent service for a fair price and the person selling gets a fair return on investment in labor. They think that they can top-down engineer their way towards more fair and just outcomes. It's like a teeter-totter. You're always looking to move the fulcrum to balance the two major competing interests. But in this push to engineer more just outcomes, they're accidentally hamstringing the ability of local businesses to innovate and grow. Regulation has been done in the interest of the general public, at the expense of businesses large and small. Small business owners are neck and neck with Jesus as the most fetishized beings in American politics, but right here, in the city that federal politicians come to do their work, it's increasingly tough to be one. Uh, my
my final point is that the city council has created a major national security breach with a large number of unregulated SUVs and SUV drivers now operating for hire in the district. It is simply a matter of time until a terrorist organization uses a few of them packed with explosives to kill large numbers of people. Large numbers of such vehicles parked under the convention center during the Congressional Black Caucus activities and or the large numbers permitted to drive in the drive entry areas of the city's most, favor most fashionable hotels should send chills down the backs of every person in this room. And this is verified by the photo exhibit that you have been given. And I think that the regulation of the sedans is absolutely necessary. Thank you.